Corrigan, and I'm so happy to be sitting next to Stephen Johnson. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be sitting next to you. Yeah. Um, so this is a beautiful book. I mean, not only just the writing, but also the construction and the design mm. of it. Yeah, yeah. How long did it take you to find all those photographs? <laughs> well, this is the first book that I've ever done in concert with a, a TV series, um, which we did on, on PBS. And the so we had photographs that were being used as kind of archival images. Um, for the show, and, and then there's some that actually we found just for the for the book. But we want, yeah, we wanted it to have that feel of, it still feels like a book you want to read, but yes. it also has that extra level of, you know, my, my publisher keeps talking about it's it's the ultimate like Christmas present for dad, you know, uh -huh. like it's just just a little nicer than your normal history yes. book with the color and the paper. It's it's it's. Is uh, there any talk of folding it into the curriculum? I kept thinking like this would be the most fantastic book to read yeah. as a class. Yeah, I, I, we're seeing a lot of that already, um, both with the book and and with the show because it, it in a way it's a book about science and and tech um, and kind of STEM issues in a mm -hmm. way that doesn't feel like your traditional Absolutely kind of STEM, not. Uh, textbook. And because it's anchored in the stories of all these generally kind of insane people, um, and there's so many interesting kind of twists of unintended consequences of people, one person yeah. inventing something and triggering all these crazy changes. So it has a, I think it has kind of storytelling that gets you into the science and yeah. into the technology and, and hopefully inspires kids to, to go out and try and solve some of these problems themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's so character rich. Yeah. yeah so yeah. is there a relationship between like kind of low level functional insanity and <laughs> the potential to innovate? I, I mean, it's amazing. Like, how, I, uh, one of the things I think is funny is that there are multiple people in the book who were called the lunatic of Boston. Uh -huh. just, 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 just it's a hot title. Well, I, I mean, Boston alone seems to have this capacity for both creating eccentric people and then mocking them <laughs> uh, for their work. You know, they do. Just, they have both know, sides you know, of the equation. Really, it's very conservative and very kind of adventurous. Um, and also, a shockingly large number of the people in the book w are arrested. So at some point, yes. like in prison for like you know fraud with their investors or you know running out of money. So yeah, there is a uh, they're mavericks. So they you know they they sometimes and maybe get into they trouble. just don't cow to limitations. Like if you're going to yeah. break a barrier, yeah. even if it's a legal one that might put you in jail, <laughs> um, or a social one where people think that you're nuts at the cocktail party. Yeah. But that might also speak to like yeah. this idea that I'm not afraid to say a strange thing or try something yeah, unknown. Yeah, the other thing that they have that's so important is just they're all intensely curious about the world, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they just stumble. Like, I, mean, I have this whole story about Clarence Birdseye in inventing the kind of flash freezing process of frozen food, and he goes ice fishing in, in, in Labrador, and he, he basically catches this fish, and it freezes almost immediately, and uh, he thaws it out two days later, and it tastes better than any frozen food he's ever mm -hmm. had. And, and the normal thing that you and I would do at that point is we would say, well, that was a very tasty fish, <laughs> and now I'm going to go to bed. You yeah. know? But he's like, but why was it tasty? What was right. it about that fish? And, uh, and he goes off and does all these experiments, basically, trying to figure out what was it about the freezing process. And that eventually leads to developing this flash freezing technology, which seems kind of trivial because you're like, frozen TV dinner is a big right. deal. But actually, that is crucial to uh, freezing human embryos and eggs and uh -huh. and all the kind of reproductive technologies that we have today date back to that advance in our ability so to that make guy's things cold. Frozen fish. Exactly, exactly. So there are like millions of people alive today who wouldn't have been alive had had that kind of technology of cold not, not been developed. You wonder, did you feel as you were researching each person that if they hadn't sussed it out the next person would have? Or was there anything that you discovered that you thought God bless this one person yeah. because I don't think I think that the mind that created this or, or saw this is so unique that if they hadn't, we just wouldn't have it today. That's a great question. Generally, the way that things work with invention is um, an idea becomes imaginable at a certain point in history because mm -hmm. of breakthroughs in science or technology or markets or whatever. And once it hits that threshold, there are dozens of people who have the same idea yeah. and kind of simultaneously hit upon the same. Uh, invention or scientific breakthrough, um, but every now and then there are people who kind of steer those inventions in ways that weren't inevitable. And and so in the book I talk about Jacob Rees, the great 19th century uh, muckraker progressive, who took the technology, the new technology of flash photography, which basically mm -hmm. hadn't existed, and shortly after it was invented, he he went and used it to photograph the incredible urban poverty in Five Points in New York that became central to his book, How the Other Half Lived, which changed American politics yeah. forever. And 
you know, what I think is great about that story is it was inevitable that someone was going to invent flash photography by the end of the 19th yes. century. And in fact, dozens of people were working on it. But what was not inevitable was that one of the first uses of it would be to shine light on the, right. these conditions of human suffering and, and change politics. That was Jacob Rees. Yeah, that was my favorite of, of all the stories in the book. Although I love the ice story. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I yeah. love, that is just insane. Tell, talk yeah. about the ice yeah, this guy going from New Hampshire to Bombay. Uh, yeah, I, t ironically, just this morning, I was giving a talk and one of his descendants, Frederick ah. Tudor, was in the <laughs> audience. And so I was like, I kind of said some mean things about your <laughs> great, great grandfather. I hope <laughs> you forgive me. <laughs> Um, he didn't feel too close to him. He, he basically, in the, in the beginning of the uh, 1800s, as a young man in, in Boston, hit on this idea of carving blocks of ice out of frozen New England lakes and shipping them to, to places like Miami and, and to places like the Caribbean, where in the 1800s, if you had lived your life entirely in the tropics, you would have never seen ice. It was right. physically impossible to create ice. Yeah, so all those drinks with like the little umbrella Yeah, yeah exactly. That was really not part of the not scene. Not native. And, so he, he's one of the lunatics of Boston, and he had this idea. And actually, he had to do some complicated work to get the ice, keep it from melting. But that wasn't the hard part. The hard part was once he got the ice to places like Martinique, he showed up, and people were like, what do I do with that? Right, what crazy thing have yeah. you brought to me? <laughs> yeah, well, that I, looks I've, useless. We've lived here for 300 years, and we've never had ice, so yeah. why, why do we need it? And so he had to actually kind of educate the market about ice cream or taking a cold bath on a hot summer's night and yeah. so on. And But eventually it became, for a while, the second biggest export in the United States behind cotton. We were shipping ice all over the world to Bombay so and to when Rio. You, when and so this guy shipped a block of ice, how big was the block of ice? It would be like, you know, kind of this this size. And, and that thing would make it all the way. If you insulate it with sawdust, which basically yeah. has the same principle as styrofoam, um, and you know, keep it out of the sun, you basically are just exposing, the, the interior bit of the ice is perfectly frozen. Right. It's just the exterior. And so if you can protect that a little bit, mm -hmm. it'll last. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. So what, um, what's somebody who's innovating right now that you're really excited to see what they do with the rest of their lives? I mean, you know, the obvious answer is Elon Musk, yes. you know, Tesla and SpaceX. And I mean, it, there's been this kind of riff of Elon Musk is the new Steve Jobs, but in a way, he's kind of better. <laughs> as much as I think Steve Jobs is amazing, because he's he's pioneering in three totally different fields. You know, he's yeah. inventing and he's literally reinventing rocket science. He's he's doing solar panels and he's inventing a, a, the first big successful electric car, arguably in in history. So uh, it, it, I think that's great to see. And is this the, is this the impact of cross pollinating? Is this the the person who dabbles and who's yeah. just endlessly curious? And then it allows for these breakthrough thoughts because you're. I mean, there are people who uh, do science who also like paint oil paintings in their garage. Yeah. And you just wonder if there's some magic there. Well, I, I think that's a point that's not often, I mean, I s preach a lot about kind of cross-disciplinary thinking um, in the stuff that I've written and talked about in, in, in this book and the show. But, but Musk is a really good example of that. Where I don't think people talk about this enough. There has actually been a lot of overlap between the different companies where they, they seem to be three totally different fields. but. They're using the solar panels from Solar City to power the supercharger stations that the, the mm -hmm. Tesla car gets, you know, electricity from. And a lot of the material science that they learn about in making the rockets for SpaceX go into the physical manufacture of the Model S car. And, and so there's a lot of, uh, of interaction between them. And that is, you know, that's if, if you're focused entirely on one field, you can do a lot of great work, but you're less likely to have a big breakthrough idea yes. because you're just singularly focused on one thing. And it's that eclectic movement back and forth between different interests, yes. between your, your central focus and your hobbies, for instance. Yes. Um, that's where the, the most so interesting ideas come from. I so hope this affects education. I hope someone is Good. watching who is thinking about what we're doing with our kids and, and not siloing them and giving them exposure yeah. to um, the broadest possible curriculum so that these fantastic little kismet moments can happen. Yeah. No, I hope so, too. Uh, tell me what you're going to do in 2015 that's great and exciting that we should all be uh, I'm going to rest for a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How long will you be I'm resting? Rest because we 30, need you. 30, 30 days. We need you in the conversation. Um, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're actively talking about trying to do more of the show and, and uh, to continue this, this project further. So hopefully we'll be, we'll be back with more episodes and another book. If you, had, if you had been able to include one more innovation in the book, you included six, 
what was the? There were a lot that we that we looked at, and maybe we'll do it someday. I, one of the things I'm really fascinated with is technologies of illusion, things that trick our eyes into seeing things that aren't there, which actually is a huge part of how we entertain ourselves, right? I uh -huh. mean, from perspective and painting all the way to you know the persistence of vision that enables us to see motion and movies or TV. So there's a whole kind of interesting brain science and technology about tricking our eyes to see uh, things that actually aren't there that is central now to yeah. human society and to what we do for fun. And th I think that would be a pretty interesting chapter. One more quick question. Yeah. Do you see anything happening around social justice that's really innovative? Back to your comment about photographing the poor and yeah. how that changed po public policy. Well, well, there's a really great um, movement actually wrote about a little bit in, in my last book, Future Perfect, of innovation happening in cities, really, and the way that decision making happening happens in cities and communities, and democratizing that process a lot more, so that people, and we see this actually in the developing world, where um, where people are making decisions about what they need in their neighborhood, and often in, in some of the poorest neighborhoods in these big mega cities um, around the world, it's sometimes called participatory budgeting and things like that, and, it, and it's basically saying, listen, you know, you people living in the streets um, and right. in, in these communities, you actually know what you need best. Let's let you just make these mm -hmm. decisions. Sometimes using technology, but sometimes just organizing people in a room to have these conversations. Yep. Um, yep. And I think there's a lot. There's a lot of really great innovation happening in city governance, which mm -hmm. seems like a really unlikely place for that to happen, but it, but it's true. Oh, we could just talk to you all day. It's so great. Thank you so much from everybody oh, here. Oh, great. Thank you so much for having me.